Uh, yesterday, I, uh, around noon hour, I received a, a phone call from the uh, Heart FM, Chris, uh, interviewing me for 10 minutes. And the first thing he asked me is, Dr. Chow, why would you take such an interest in coming to, uh, to the county of Oxford to, uh, to give a speech? I said, no, no. I say, well, actually, dated back to 150 years ago, Dr. Leslie George McKay, he came to Taiwan. And I was raised up in Taiwan. And he came to Taiwan and to northern Taiwan, especially Danshui. He established churches, schools, and hospitals. Uh, for information, the McKay Hospital is a very famous hospital system in Taiwan, specialized in cancer treatment and research. That's quite a marvelous uh, link between Taiwan and Oxford. And I'm here just to, as a part of it, the effort to uh, reestablish the link and strengthen the collaboration. So here I am. Uh, the topic for my talk, I prepared a lot of uh, uh, view graphs, but I think I can stop at any time if you have any question. Because I think the dialogue is more important than the content itself. The topic would be circuit economy, a mindset change leading to sustainability, a mindset change. Well, we, nowadays we, we hear circuit economy a lot, but what actually it is? And the why circuit economy at this time, as opposed to linear economy? Well, linear economy is a throwaway society. In the circular economy, you just have to make use of everything we have, and the waste is not a waste. It's a misallocated resource. And uh, how can we make use of the things we think it's a waste? How can we add value to it? How can we uh, uh, dig less from the ground and uh, make use of everything we have already? So that's. Uh, and uh, the next thing I would like to share with you is uh, how should we approach it, rather than a, a, a uh, throwaway society. And uh, what are the considerations? There's a lot of considerations. It will not fall from heaven. It's a beautiful t uh, slogan, but to do it is not that easy. And the basic thing, we need a mindset, uh, mindset change. We need the uh, old people to get involved from government, from industry, community, research, academia, everybody. So it's a collective effort. And the short of that, this thing is not but, it, all this circular economy is nothing but a dream. And uh, there are some successful practices in, worldwide, in Europe, in Asia, and a part of uh, uh, Canada and the United States, I'm sorry, United States presents the worst example. But I will share with you what has been done. And what are the potential barriers? Well, we talk about, well, in Oxford, we have uh, the 100% uh, re renewable energy plan. We also have a zero waste plan. But what does it mean to us? Will, will it happen naturally? No, it will not, unless we change our mindset. And the f lastly, we uh, share with you what is the way forward to achieve circular economy. Well, circular economy seeks to rebuild the capital, whether this is the financial, manufacturer, human, social, and the natural capitals. So key words is financial capital, and the social capital, and the natural capital. I'll explain to that a li uh, later on. It, it, it is to enhance the flows of goods and uh, services. And uh, it has to create a sort of synergistic effect and also symbiotic e effect. And this view graph is too, uh, too complicated. Uh, in words, what it means is that in, before the Industrial Revolution, we already have a circular economy. The nature will take care of everything, it recycles and recycles. But uh, ever since, the Industrial Revolution, and it's a way of no return. Because whatever we take from the Earth, 
and we fabricate it into something uh, for functionality, it's very difficult to, back, to get back to the original purpose. And that is our challenge. How can we get it back to the, to the, to the system as a whole? And in worldwide, we already have a lot of initiatives in this area. For, for example, in Ontario, we do have uh, the Bill 101, uh, 151, which was enacted last year, and which is called uh, Waste Free Ontario Act or Resource Recovery and the Circular Economy Act. In Japan, we have a law for promotion of uh, efficient utilization resources. In Denmark, there's a Green Transition Fund, Danish uh, MGB, et cetera, et cetera. In Taiwan, there's a Resource Recycling and Resource Reuse Act. It's not a perfect act yet, but so I mean, and all of this illustrate the efforts uh, from many countries who realize the, uh, the threat to the 21st century and would like to do something about it. Uh, circular economy, in other ways, there will be no waste, zero waste. Zero waste, it sounds great, but what do we mean by that? Is it zero waste generation? Well, it's very tough. And uh, is it zero waste from production to consumption? Well, think about it, what does it mean? And waste, zero waste to landfill? Well, that's easier to do because what, we can prevent the waste from the, to the landfill by doing a lot of things. Or, or is it a zero waste within a defined boundaries, like Oxford County, or we're talking about Ontario, or are we talking about Canada, or are we talking about North America? Because when the boundary in, enlarges, the chances of achieving zero waste will become greater. It requires economic scale. Because in each country, in each defined boundary, there's only a few opportunities that you can reutilize it or recycle it. So you must go beyond. Or are we talking about zero waste at local, regional, or national level? Well, I basically I'm repeating what I said before. You have to think about a boundary. You cannot lock yourself in and think that I can make a zero waste within a facility. There's no way. I don't believe so. If you can talk about industrial park, yes, you got a better chance. But if you go 50 kilometers beyond the industrial park, you get a greater chance. So the po points to ponder is, uh, first of all, this, uh, this circular economy, is it achievable or, or is it fictional? I'll say that to you that if we don't take all things into consideration, it's purely a fiction. But if we put all the acts together, yes, it is achievable. So the first thing we have to think about, what are the ways that means to achieve zero waste goals? You know, by enforcement, or by voluntary actions, or by an industrial cluster, or the collaboration between the industry and the communities, we have to find a, a appropriate ways and means to do it. And what are the mechanisms to implement zero waste systems? Who is taking the lead in this? We need a champion. No matter which uh, zero waste we're talking about, we need a champion to preferably a, uh, a, a big company who has resources to do this, to and work together with the uh, surrounding industries and the communities. What are the necessary and the sufficient conditions? Well, when we talk about re zero waste, we generally refer to technology, recycling technology. But recycling technology or recovery technology, can it alone do the job? I don't think so. Unless there's a social acceptance or market acceptability, or there's an added value, nothing will work. Whatever you do, it may turn into another, turn into another garbage because you cannot sell it in the market because the society is not ready to accept it. 
because of the quality concern, because of many issues, uh, because it comes from the waste. And people's perception is, uh, uh, will not be that easy to overcome. So I would say that technology provides the necessary condition, but social science, social factors are the net sufficient conditions to achieve the uh, circular economy. There's also regulatory issues here. For example, we do have a Waste Management Act and this and that. But if you think, if you define the waste as a waste without delisting it and make it available for the re recycling industry, then, they, then the regulation itself is a, is a barrier. It happens in many, many countries, like in Southeast Asia, when they consult with me, like Indonesia, they say, well, they would like to do recycling, but, but the government is very adamant in, uh, in uh, restricting the use of the waste. And also, the financial aspects. Well, when we talk about zero waste, we need a, a system, a class to work, and so we have to treat the, uh, the the cluster as an entity. But then, in terms of the permission, the permit we're giving to these cluster, how are we going to do it? It's like a balloon concept. No, no, you're no longer treating each individual waste generator as a, as a and they give that permit uh, to the individual companies. You have to think about how can we give a, a, a uh, umbrella permit and et cetera, et cetera. Even on the f financial aspects, it will be the same issue. And what are the incentives for zero waste programs? Well, people, well, we human beings that tend to be very lazy, lazy more, and we can do, well, we can uh, live well without doing anything, but what, what is the incentive for me to do it? There has to be something like that, for example, in uh, the incentives could be that we give the we provide uh, award those good performers with certain things and or reduce the bartering frequencies and this and that or give some rather than money you know we can give them something for them to uh, enhance the corporate image and public awareness of zero waste implications well, I don't think that uh, public is, is not fully aware. You know, it's a, to them, it's a good thing to hear. But zero waste means uh, they have to start from themselves. So, uh, is the goal achievable? Well, the factors of failures and success. Well, I can share with you later on what, the, what, what, could, be, what could lead to failure and what could lead to the success and the strategy for ensure, ensuring uh, success. Looking at this view graph here, uh, this is a view graph uh, about uh, the challenge facing the 21st century, the triple bottom line. Well, here I, I present to you the three capitals uh, that we have to look at. The first one is the financial capital, and the second one is the natural capital, and the third one is the human capital. In, in uh, 2014, a bunch of Harvard people come to Donghai University where I served as a vice president upon request from my alma mater. And we had a forum on the, uh, the ideal city through innovation and education. And so I present this uh, view graph and for, uh, just for the sake of uh, uh, discussion. So the Harvard people asked me, well, financial capital, they can easily understand. What is the natural capital? Because in financial capital, in, when we talk about economic growth, we assume that it is unlimited. We can grow on and on and on. But it's based on the credit system, which means borrow from the future. So I mentioned to them that natural capital is a land resource, air resource, water resource, mineral resource, energy resource, Everything we depend upon to make the financial work, the capital work. But we all know that the natural capital is limited. So how can be the economic growth be
be unlimited without due consideration of giving a value to water, to air, to land, a proper value, not the superficial value we are giving it now. It's a big challenge. Uh, unless we incorporate that thinking into the financial or economic system, nothing will work. Because we already are taking so much out of this earth and uh, we are uh, polluting and damaging this earth to a great extent that it's not going to be sustainable. So this is another one, just to repeat what I said. We have just too much production, uh, too much consumption, and uh, too much waste. Well, this dated back to the mid-century, uh, mid-20th century, the two Nobel Prize were given to one on the integrated circuit, and the other one is polymer. And these two inventions make our life of no return. So everything changes after that. And now, even on the, on the smartphones, now we're producing it billions of uh, smart, smartphone sets a year. But you have to remember, the smartphones, especially the plastic part, are not recyclable, period and end, at this time. What it means is that we're keeping digging from the earth what we need to make the plastics eventually become a very high level functional uh, plastics which are not recyclable. And it's a terrible thing. And, he, and also the, uh, uh, the components, the plastic components, they tend to be carcinogenic. They're up in high Himalayan mountain, they're up in Tibet plateau, as described in, in 2009 by a professor from University of Toronto in Beijing. It is a fact, and it's everywhere in the world. So with all that, this poses a threat to us. And environment issues are, are genuinely overlooked. Well, maybe Canada is one of the better countries who is taking this seriously. I don't believe that is true in the United States because uh, the many pushing the po pulling forces there. And in South Asia countries or in China, for example, well, the general perception of the public is still uh, not giving a proper consideration to this. And look at this figure here. This is a figure given by Professor Yamamoto from Univers University of Tokyo. Uh, it was done quite a few years ago, but even with this figure here, you can see that in every second, we're producing 390,000 cubic meter of CO2. Well, I can tell, share with you that this much is that even to capture one cubic meter of CO2 takes a lot of money. And we are producing almost 400,000 cubic meter of CO2. This is what it is. Very bad. And uh, the trend is getting worse and worse. And we talk about the ground, uh, greenhouse gas re uh, reduction, but the, uh, but the reality is that it's keep rising. And, uh, uh, and so where's the future for us? Every time when I look at my granddaughter, I, uh, I was always thinking, what is going to happen to her when she grows up? She's going to be faced with a, a, a terrible world, a lot of toxics everywhere, and even for the, uh, to get a, a safe and a healthy water or air could be very difficult. All of this points to an unsustainable future. And look at this, uh, all these minerals here. Many minerals, we get only, only about 25 years life. And with, beyond that, you know, we, it's gone. So we met, must do a good thing in recycling it. So this is the key view that I would like to share with you. To ensure sustainability, we must do more with less. Well, it means recycling, but recycling is an easy word 
but unless you add value to everything you recycle, that will not work. And also, with the technology development, we are also doing more with less, like the internet replaces the emails, and uh, in future, <coughs> we are designing things for uh, to be to, to become more efficient, uh, more energy efficient, and more material efficient, and all this means doing more with less. So it goes both ways. You from the design stage to operation stage to uh, to recycle stage. And the most important thing is that we need to change our wasteful pattern to green consumption. Green consumption. It's easy to say, but may not be that difficult, may not, may not be that easy to actually digest into our culture and the routine work. In 2004, when I was invited to uh, Nankai University in Beijing and uh, joined a uh, international circular economy uh, conference, so I share some experience which we had elsewhere. And uh, in the end, oh, there's one question from one of the uh, professors. He said, well, Dr. Chow, I understand what you really mean. Well, he said, uh, when, you, when in Taiwan, when you talk about circular economy, you have to make it more e economic first and then circulate it. Is that true? I said, yes. Otherwise, there's no incentive for people to do that. You cannot rely on governmental subsidy to support it forever and ever. And, and at, at night, there's a bunch of uh, social scientists who want to have a, some work with me. So the question they ask is, so Dr. Chow, you are a chemical engineer. You talk about a lot, a lot of technical solutions. But what we are a bunch of uh, social scientists, what should we do then? Well, I couldn't really answer the question, so I turned the question around. I said that, well, China is getting richer and richer every year. And as a reward, I guess the people are tends to buy new things, new appliances, new houses, new cars, new whatever. And it's, it's, I said, and is it correct? And then everybody said yes. And then I turned it around and said, well, if you know that in these new devices or new appliances, there's some recycling component in it, would you buy it? Everybody says, no. We pay for it. Why should we have something in the recycling component in it? And then I said, well, sir, madam, now we're talking about circular economy. If you yourself are not in it, so how can you make a circular economy work now, is that, now that it is a national policy? And it is up to you as a social science trying to convert or to educate people to change their mindset into green consumption. Without that, nothing works. So that's a key message I'm bringing here. Without green consumer, there will be no green producer. We have to start from ourselves. And the, the other thing is about the law. We always talk to, about pro, environmental protection, but protection is to deal with the problems after it occurs. Well, it's costly. It's too late. Because people will then, in that case, will play hide and seek a game. You know, it's a midnight dumping and sort of things. We need to make it into a proactive conservation, from protection to conservation. That is another key word. In other words, we have to start from the design stage to operation stage to the use stage to make sure that we're conserving it, not just to consume it. And lastly, we need to change the regulation or the system into, from the waste management to resource management. In other words, that's nothing called waste. So, oh, I, oh, basically I said it already, it's a misallocated resource. Uh, our job 
is to find an appropriate technology and an appropriate market to add value to it, to do it in the right way. Uh, there's always a barrier there, but we need to work collectively among the community, the research people, the government people, industry people, to resolve the issues one by one. For example, in Taiwan, when we're trying to promote this uh, eco-industrial networking, and one of the problems we have is, according to Taiwan, the government has a procurement law that you need to open bid and to, to, uh, to resolve, to, to deal with the, 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 uh, the waste management issue, but it cannot be. Because if you go for the open bid, you cannot assure the, uh, uh, the long-term contract between the generators and the users. So there's, there'll be a lot of issues involved. So when we talk about uh, the, uh, the circular economy, it's a paradigm shift from linear to circular. And it's a circular means that it's going around and around. And to go around and around, of course, it is a change from our daily practice now. So we, we need to be innovative and entrepreneurial in doing this. And uh, so we, we need to look at the regulation aspect, financial aspect, and the technology aspect, the market aspect. Well, to do more with less, that's, uh, again, we need to be uh, to dig less from the ground and conserve it and be innovative and entrepreneurial in production system development and application. And we need to look at it from the life cycle assessment point of view. For example, we all talk about solar, solar energy. Solar energy is beautiful from the user's end, but from the manufacturer side, it's a nightmare because the material efficiency is only less than 10%. In other words, whoever is producing the solar panel, they're suffering. Have we ever thought about that? You know, for example, in China, China, they make solar panels, but they also, at the same time, inviting their own problem. So all these things have to be, think about that, to put into perspective, to say which is cleaner energy. So, when we, when we do identify the problem, then we have to solve the problem. How can we increase the material efficiency of the solar panel manufacturing? That kind of thing. It's all in, it has to be in our mind. We cannot just look things in isolation. It's, it's not going to be the good for the world because this world is run and run. You know, it, will, it starts from somewhere, you come to somewhere. And even now, we realize that uh, there are some uh, carcinogens thrown over from the Asia to Canada now. Well, it may be not alerting at this time, but when the time accumulates, when it goes on and on, it will affect us. So this is the kind of issue we're thinking far ahead. And also, to, we, when we do the recycling, we need to add value to recover resource material. I'm giving you a personal experience of my own. When I was invited to, cons to uh, consult with China Steel about the waste, and that was 20 years ago. That when in the steel making, you do generate sp uh, spent liquor, pickle liquor. Uh, well, in, other, in, a, in, a, in an opportunity, it's just a waste asset. This waste at is extremely toxic. It's not only the acid, but also it contains the, uh, the heavy metals. So the first thing China Steel did is to recover the acid, hydrochloric acid, to 17% and send it back to the process for reuse. But then what is left over is the residues, which contains iron oxide and, and other things. So the next step, they would, well, it's by phases because you cannot do everything in one shot. We, and then you need to do the technology research to make it perfect and to make sure that it works in a, in a large scale production. 
So the sec second thing they would they did is to make it into crude iron oxide and they sell it. But still, there are some residues there. I can tell, share with you this much. And next thing they would do is purify the iron oxide. And the last thing they did is pulverize the iron oxide to make it into electronic grade magnetic material to be used in the uh, electric industry. That is value addition. Otherwise, it's not a garbage. So that's what we have to bear in mind. We need a technology breakthrough to bring up to the electronic grade or methodological grade or whatever grade, industry grade, to make it work. Because this, we, the, in the zero waste system, we have to make it sure that it's gonna be self-sufficient financially. Unless there's a, a profitability, there will be no sustainability. We cannot depend on, the well, government may kick in to some money to initiate it, to help the startup. But if you cannot foresee what is going to be, you're going to do, to do or win in the market in the future, the game is finished. Well, this is what I personally experienced in Taiwan. I did a lot of things in Asia and even in the uh, Middle East. So the key to this, when we do, there must be a me benchmark to measure the success the green competitiveness, before and after we do it. <laughs> well, we have to look at whatever we do, what is the total value of the products and services after we have done the zero waste, in other words, to create value, divided by the impact of the environment. In other words, with that, how much material we are consumption we are reducing, or energy, or CO2 emission. Well, for, for information, everything we recycled, correspondingly, there's a reduction in, in greenhouse gas because you are no longer digging from the earth. You are cut half in between. You, for example, in the, uh, you, we, you take a, uh, a uh, metal waste and uh, re and put it back to the uh, to the metallurgical process. Then you save a lot of problems of mining and ore and the flotation and a lot of things that basically cut your CO2 by at least half. That's what it is. Well, in in the China silk case, they make the furnace slack into cement. That reduces as compared to the the conventional cement, it helps to reduce 90% of the CO2. So it has a double benefit. But again, I think the important thing is that as a consumer, each of us, you and me, we need to start from our own habit and value concept. I think the, the Europeans generally are the best in this. Well, in, uh, I, I mentioned it before that in 1999, I was in Seoul attending a, uh, a ISO conference. And within that, there was a design for environment. And then the guy sitting beside me, he's a CEO from, uh, from Belgium. And his business is a leasing corporation. And so I asked him, what you, are you doing here as a leasing representative? Uh, what he says to me is that in Europe, they believe that all these goods and are made from the resources from the ground. We're simply borrowing. Well, God gave it to us. We're simply borrowing it for our own purpose, but we have to return it to the system for reuse. So the manufacturers and suppliers and uh, in Europe, they form a releasing corporation, and uh, upon the the uh, termination of the leasing contract, then everything had to return. To and as a CEO, he has to learn what make what are the difficulties of returning and recycling. Design for disassembly, design for 
low, tax, low toxicity design for this and that. And I was uh, really amazed with the, the concept of Europeans. And I guess now this, com this practice is, has been spread over to other parts of the world. This is kind of the very concept we need to adopt. And uh, as I said before, that unless we, as a consumer, we push the producers to be green, the, there's no incentives for the producers to be green. And we need also a multi-stakeholder partnership between the government, industry, academia, com uh, uh, community. There's the legal issues, administrative issues, everything can think of. For example, when you build up a, the symbiotic uh, network uh, to transport the steam or, or any uh, industrial gas within the industrial park, the right of way of the pipeline needs to be resolved because nobody's taking care of it. So whoever the whoever the the is spellheading the effort needs to put some effort into that. And there's a lot of uh, unseen, which are non-technical issues, which is left in for nobody to resolve. So somebody has to come up as a as a leader to do it. And it's like a champion. I guess, well, this morning we heard up from the General Moro. I think the General Moro is a good one to lead the effort. Well, uh, Doug Yes, he mentioned about the General Moro worldwide, how beautiful the job has been done. But I would like to invite him, the General Moro in St. Catherine here locally, how can they participate in a local event? Well, I asked. Well, there's a question about the agricultural waste and the bio waste. Yes, the renewable, new, renewable energy. One of the renewable energy mentioned, well, maybe it can be made from the agricultural waste. That's how, well, when we talk about a zero waste, we have to start in the, uh, uh, to look at a site-specific and lo lo locality-specific case and to see how we can mobilize everybody together. Otherwise, no, I think we're, we'll be just like a NATO, talking only, no action. We need somebody to demonstrate, to lead, and, uh, and educate the public and the zero waste participation. I, uh, I think we are doing a very good job here already. In, when we look at the lunch hour, we're sorting everything out. It's a good start, but so is everything else. Well, the sorting is very important. Uh, if we are not careful in sorting, it introduces complexities and problems and the cost in the later separation and the recycling business. Because recycling if, it depends on purity of the elements or materials that we are extracting. When you get too many things mixed up, it just adds cost, makes it not profitable. And we have to align multiple resources in science, technology, and venture capital to accelerate innovation to business process. And this is a typical uh, example of Netherlands. You know, with all these benefits, it, uh, cons this is how much they conserve in natural resources and uh, create jobs and uh, reduce CO2 and uh, reduce the uh, the use of natural resources, reduce the use of water and the land. These are all the benefits. And now I'm going to share with you something that's been done in Taiwan. Uh, there are too many things here. Well, in Taiwan, for example, there's only, uh, there's a law that between the waste management and resource recycling and the Re Reuse Act. Well, if the Waste, so-called waste. Uh, it's lose. It has already lost. Uh, lost its original purpose. Then we have a two way to go. If it can be recyclable, then we go. It goes into the recycling act. Otherwise, it go to waste disposal act. 
But even if when you go to the Waste Disposal Act, the two general types of thing, which is municipal type and the other one industrial type, even when, when you go down to that level, the government is going to watch it to see whether there's any uh, potential for recycling. And uh, so the most important one, I will skip the, a lot of this thing here. Basically, in Taiwan, the, the general concept is there's no thing, nothing called waste. You ha everything has to be circulated. And the garbage is divided into, generally speaking, the food waste and uh, recyclables and the trash. And there's no curbside collection in Taiwan. And then the trucks will come at a scheduled time at this designated locations, and the household people will have to deliver at the at the time and sort it out into different uh, different bins, different uh, right on spot. If you do it wrong, the uh, it will be rejected, and you have to take it back. And it happened to me. That's also uh, let me see. There's one thing which I'd like to share with you. There's a lot of things going on. Well, this is what I'd like to share with you in terms of the community. There's four-in-one recycling program. Well, there are four partners here. The first one is community and the residents, including even the 7-Elevens, even uh, the, some uh, uh, religious organizations. They participate in collecting the waste. And then the second thing, this will be delivered to the, in the proper way to recycling industries. And these recycling industries, they have only one thing in mind, making a profit. So they have to look at what kind of thing can they can make it this into a high price stuff, rather than well, to take a waste tire into a toy, a toy for the children, that's not recycling. Unless you can make the plastics into clothes and the functional tex textiles and that kind of thing, well, then nobody is going to do it. So we're all aiming at high value addition thing. So the recycling industries are doing that. Uh, the one advantage of Taiwan for doing this because Taiwan basically has no natural resources, not in energy form, not in mineral form, nothing. So that drives Taiwan to make use of everything they, in, uh, they have in hand, i.e. waste. And the local government is coming, participating in this, and sending the trucks in to collect everything. And uh, everything you buy in Taiwan there's a fee, collection and a recycling fee in that. So that money is all put into a recycling fund, which is administered by the Environment Protection Administration. And this fund management is responsible for allocating the money and the materials. And that's how the cash and the material flows among the four partners. It works beautifully. I can share with you, I'm part of it, behind it. You know, I, when I was invited back to Taiwan, the first thing I said, well, Taiwan in the old time, the 20 or 30 years ago, they invite people from international society coming back to advise them what they should do. But I, I would say that the government was very quick to take good advice and do it little by little. And the first thing I did is help them to develop the technologies. The, the technology which I mentioned to you about how can we make it into a high value stuff. Uh, there's a lot of examples of that. And the second thing, we have to also to resolve the, the conflicts in regulations and also res to st help to set up the appropriate standards for recycled products. Otherwise, the market will be in disorder and the things like that. And then this is a, uh, a view got off taken from this OECD. OECD cite Taiwan as a very successful country in pushing for circular economy. 
And in terms of education, of course, it goes down to the kindergarten, to the elementary school, and the school universities, and everywhere. And uh, the, in terms of waste statistics, Taiwan used to be a garbage, garbage dump all over the country. And uh, a while back, a uh, Miss Universe from Turkey, he was, she was invited to Taiwan for a tour upon departure. And the reporter asked her, what is her general remark about Taiwan? And uh, Taiwan at that time was really in bad shape. A lot of uh, growth, but uh, not enough uh, work on uh, waste management. So what she said is, Taiwan represents a bunch of rich people living in a garbage dump. But now, look what happened. The waste generation per capita per day, uh, it went down from 1.1 kilogram per person per day down to 0 0.3, 0 0.34. As a result, the, the uh, mega scale uh, incinerators, half of them are shut down now. The incinerator at the time was done in a haste, trying to resolve the piles of mountains of uh, uh, the garbage. And now half of them is closed. And the, the, the EPA was criticized for over designing it. So you never win, because if you do a good job, you can be still criticized. And uh, I think the next thing Taiwan is doing is trying to, now that the waste is being considered as a re resource or material, then we need to do a good flow analysis of this reverse logistics. And these two uh, this t the next two view graphs is, uh, are those ones which I personally in, uh, involved, I was in charge of. Uh, the first one is a, we called it Environmental Science and Technology Park, which was uh, uh, part of the EPA job to establish new eco-industrial park, to take the waste into this park and uh, make into value-added products in terms of material and energy form and, uh, and ship it out. And the second one is in the southern Taiwan and that is the, uh, the champion is here right in the middle, the China Steel Corporation, CSC, who works together with power company, with a lot of other metal companies or, uh, or petroleum company to get themselves you know, all the material flows, energy flows, everything. And to make, and as a result, this industrial park produces more than one million metric tons per CO2, uh, CO2 per year. And with uh, almost like uh, two million metric tons of material being reused. And there's also energy recovery being advanced from the uh, a pure incineration in the wa waste to energy and to organic matter used as a fuel directly, pyrolysis, gasification, anaerobic fermentation, all sort of advancement. And a land reclamation in the Taipei port. But all this requires a standardization and the protocol for testing of the recycled product. And the, the key issue now is cradle to cradle. It's no longer cradle to grave. And that's a, a way to ensure the quality, to evaluate the products and uh, by five criteria. And also this uh, innovative business model, in other words, leasing the uh, creating new business model by renting instead of uh, trading. And we, uh, looking ahead, we need a even better defined green decree incorporating 
the financial aspect and everything into that. And to formulate standards for secondary raw material applications, and then there's more and more coming out. Uh, and in terms of the certification, it's also important to make sure that nothing falls through the crack. Well, the policy with the long-term goals, there's a, a systematic change and a friendly environment integration regulations. Integration of uh, regulations are, uh, in fact, very important. And developing green finance. I, and uh, by issuing the green credit, green bonds, and building a green market system. That's a, uh, unless we do all of this, it's not gonna be a true circuit economy. And these are the many jobs and the green talents being uh, developed in the past recent years. But what are the potential barriers for full implementation in the case uh, if people want to borrow experience? Well, the first is coherence among the various acts and regulations. You know, you'll find, easy to find that the, uh, the current regulations, they are not designed for circular economy. They are designed for linear economy. And we have to uh, identify the loopholes and trying to match it up. And a clear definition of waste versus recoverable resources. And a concise permitting route and requirements. I think that is very important to, to make a zero waste or, or eco-industrial networking system, we need a way to, to clear the path for the permitting. Because every, well, between that, every linkage between, on the man, material and energy, there's always investment there. And of course, for the investors that would like to see a fast return on investment. But one stumbling block to that is a permitting process. Every delay, every single day of delay in permitting means loss of money. And so we need to create a one-stop window to get through all this, uh, the, uh, the permits in the shortest days. In Taiwan, we narrow it down to 98 days, as long as the permit documents are already. To businessmen, uh, it is very important. You know, once the money is, uh, is there, and the clock is clicking, and the interest rate, you're paying for the interest rate. And the recoverable, recover products, standards, and the certification, and the market acceptability of re recover products, that's very important. You know, if people are reluctant or skeptical about the product between the good product and bad product, where's the differentiation? How can you certify it? How can you get a, any confidence in it? That's something we have to think about. Also, economic scale of resource recovery. As I said, the Oswald County is not large enough to make a zero waste, a true zero waste. So we need to work with others the surrounding counties or whoever, or the industries and the community together. To, well, it all depends on what kind of waste we're looking at. That uh, agricultural waste, maybe, yes, we have enough, but on other things, we don't. So we have to, to think, to put the resource together to make it more economic to operate. That's uh, also financing the hopeful innovators for startups. And I think this is a very good for the young startup because the young, the millennials are more concerned about their future, about the sustainability. And they have a lot of good innovative ideas. After my last lecture at uh, University of Toronto, some graduate students come to see me. They are full of enthusiasm, they're full of hope, but they lack experience. They need somebody to help them. And I think those are the good people who we should help to stimulate and give them advice and help them. And incentives for zero waste participants and programs. As I said, you know, the incentive doesn't have to be money. 
it is something else. And technology breakthroughs for value addition. And that we then, uh, we need to uh, consider the most in, uh, value added technologies. We don't need to do it ourselves, but we can simply uh, and search around uh, to improve it and uh, try to commercialize it. The way forward, again, we need a clear regulations. We need a stable and a system policy. We cannot afford to flip flop. Once we go ahead, we should do it. We have to resolve all the issues and iron the wrinkles out on the way. And we need a green deal and the certification of secondary uh, products to actually to convince ourselves to convince the consumers to ensure the market order. We need an innovative business model, and then we did the models could be any, you know, anything which can make it work. And for sure, there'll be green jobs and the talents. I think we need that. When we think about our children and children, we must act now as a responsible citizens. So that you can contact me at this email address, and uh, I welcome your questions or comments. Thank you.